Today on the AI Breakdown, we are exploring something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is the relationship between open source models, enterprise customers, AI startups, and the wider economy. Now, what prompted this is the beginnings of a narrative shift that we started to see in July. And there were two big things that got this narrative shift happening. The first was the reports that for the first time, ChatGPT traffic had actually gone down. In June, fewer people went to the ChatGPT website and mobile app than they had in May. And the second big piece of the narrative shift came when it was reported that Jasper, as well as a smaller company, Mutiny, but definitely Jasper, had cut a number of jobs in the previously assumed white-hot AI space. These things together brought up a big glaring question of whether the hype in AI was dying down. However, for careful market observers, it was less about overall hype per se, and more learning about where value is actually going to accrue in the AI space. Right around this time, AI entrepreneur Sam Hogan wrote a really compelling explanation for what was going on when it came to the AI startup space. He said six months ago, it looked like AI and LLMs were going to bring a much-needed revival to the venture startup ecosystem after a few tough years. With companies like Jasper starting to slow down, it's looking like this may not be the case. Right now, there are two clear winners, a handful of losers, and a small group of moonshots that seem promising. So the losers he characterized as the companies that had raised a huge amount of money, even though basically they were just a user experience layer on top of some other company's API. As he called it, essentially a generic thin wrapper around OpenAI. The other category of losers, he argued, were application layer AI companies that raised a bunch of VC money between December and March, based on all the hype surrounding ChatGPT, assuming that if nothing else, a plausible exit would be selling themselves to later stage or enterprise companies. Sam characterized these startups as typically having products that are more focused than something very generic like Jasper, but still not having a real technology moat. In other words, the products are easy to copy. I think that what Sam is arguing here actually has a lot to teach us about how the overall AI space is developing. And effectively, what he's arguing is, again, less about whether the patina of the artificial intelligence space as a whole is wearing off, and more about, on the one hand, whether old VC models are savable, and on the other hand, how enterprises are interacting with the AI space. Let's discuss that first dimension first, whether AI startups can save the VC model. For this, let's turn to a piece from investor Sam Lesson, also from last month. It was published in The Information, and the way he teed it up on Twitter was, seed investing isn't coming back, at least not as it existed in the last decade. Sam writes, seed investing can't turn back on unless the public market changes how it values run-of-the-mill tech companies, and that ain't happening. About 15 months ago, I wrote a post on how seed investing was pretty clearly going to be in an 18-month timeout that the capital factory line would be shut down until the inventory of dramatically overmarked late-stage private deals got worked through, washed out, or expired on the line. This is basically how the world has looked for the last almost year and a half, with the noted exception of an AI death spasm, where a bunch of funds decided to pour untold amounts of capital into AI companies on the factory model they were used to, with even higher valuations and more hype. The thing I think seed investors need to come to terms with at this point is that this isn't an 18-month timeout. It is likely much, much longer and perhaps even the death of systematic and thematic seed investing as we knew it between 2010-ish and 2022-ish. Why? Because run-of-the-mill public tech companies just aren't worth that much, it turns out. And if the bulk of so-called unicorns can't get public and or do and are disappointing, the whole model of seed investing starts to look way, way less attractive as an asset class. Now from there, Sam gets into some of the details, but I will divert our attention to the macro for a moment. One of the things that was remarkable to me living for a decade in Silicon Valley was how little the average VC took the time to understand just how much public market dynamics and macroeconomic dynamics impacted their industry. In the middle of the teens, everyone was noticing that valuations of startups were going up and up and up. The blame was put on things like Y Combinator, driving a premium for the latest startups. What was almost never discussed was the fact that after six or seven years of living in a zero interest rate world, capital had to move farther and farther out on the risk spectrum in order to find yield. For the entire teens decade, the entire period that Sam Lesson is here acknowledging as this time of seed investing, billions and billions in capital that hadn't been exposed to venture capital or even private equity was coming into those asset classes because they simply had to. It doesn't take an economics major to understand what happens when what is a relatively constricted supply of top startups meets a massively growing demand in the form of excess capital. Valuations go up, round sizes go up, companies stay private longer, and some weird dislocations start to happen. In the case of venture capital in the teens, that was funds not really having to return in practice, 
but just being able to raise ever-growing funds on the supposed IRR based on increased valuations in later rounds. This is the factory line that Sam was referring to. That factory line stopped when inflation started to rip upwards, and the Federal Reserve reversed course entirely, and we went from an era of quantitative easing and zero interest rate policies to an era of quantitative tightening, i.e. the Fed removing liquidity from the system, and the fastest rate hiking cycle in 40 years. As that has happened, there has been a massive contraction in risk capital across all asset classes that deal with risk, venture capital included. VC is simply not immune to macroeconomic changes. And so to some extent, I think it's reasonable to look at the flood of VC money into AI over the last six months as a last gasp of trying to hold on to that system. There's obviously also been a comparable frenzy in public markets where AI enthusiasm has really been one of the only things holding the markets up and has provided a strong countervailing narrative to all sorts of other insecurities throughout the year, from banking crises to debt ceiling negotiations to government debt being downgraded this week. So one part of the challenge for AI startups is that even as enthusiastic as venture capitalists have been, they're still not immune to the broader changes that are going on across the startup and venture capital landscape. But there is another really interesting dimension to this, which reveals a lot about how the AI field specifically is evolving. Remember, one of the categories of losers that Sam identified were companies who expected that they might be able to be acquired by enterprises. In his post, Sam effectively argues that these companies would prefer to build their own tools rather than become the customers or the acquirers of unproven AI startups. As he put it, an engineering leader would rather spin up their own Langchain or Chroma infrastructure for free and build tech themselves than buy something from a new unproven startup. Now, I think there are two reasons why enterprises might be heading in this direction. One has to do with risk. Yesterday, we covered McKinsey's State of AI report. And one of the interesting pieces of that report was what threats organizations consider relevant. Across the survey participants, inaccuracy was the most relevant risk, with 56% of organizations considering it a risk. Cybersecurity had 53% of organizations concerned. IP infringement had 46%. Regulatory compliance had 45%. And those were the top categories. Now keep those concerns in mind as we imagine a world in which there are two, broadly speaking, ways that an enterprise company could get into generative AI. Option one is through some sort of vendor, think ChatGPT's forthcoming business version, or on the other hand, a second pathway is spinning up one's own proprietary AI tools. For example, a large language model that's trained on proprietary data, but that's hosted perhaps on-premise and is specifically customized to an enterprise, their needs, their data, their security. It's not hard to see if one's concerns are inaccuracy, cybersecurity, IP infringement, and regulatory compliance, why that latter model of something custom spun up with data controlled by and already available to the company might appear to be a better choice than some new startup. And of course, you have to think that that has only increased after we've seen companies like Samsung ban their employees from using tools like ChatGPT after discovering them leaking sensitive data, which then becomes part of the data set that ChatGPT trains on. So on the one side, we have the risk and concern reason that enterprises might be looking away from startups and towards their own solution. But then we also have the availability side, and this gets to the title of this episode. The fact that we now live in a world with high-performance, commercially available, open-source or open-source-ish models like Llama 2 means that those enterprises aren't starting from scratch. In fact, not even close to it. There is an incredible amount of infrastructure that they have to actually go build solutions in ways that with previous technology movements they just haven't been able to. When that leaked Google note, we have no moat and neither does OpenAI came out, the leaker wasn't really talking about enterprise business models and what big corporations might do, but interestingly, their argument that the open source community was going to eat the lunch of Google and OpenAI and companies like them seems more likely for the fact that those big companies are in fact adopting open source models and customizing them for their own use rather than working with startups. Now, of course, for these enterprise companies, the landscape of choices is not actually as binary as startups on the one hand or totally custom spun up solutions on the other. The companies in the middle are the cloud providers and tech partners that already have deep relationships with those enterprises and who already host or interact with lots of their proprietary data. The Wall Street Journal published yesterday a piece called Companies Weigh Growing Power of Cloud Providers Amid AI Boom. A wave of partnerships between AI model makers and cloud providers is leading tech chiefs to assess the benefits of convenience versus becoming too reliant on any one vendor. The piece writes, 
For many businesses, the primary choice isn't which AI model to use, but whether they stay within the AI ecosystem offered by their cloud providers. If a company chooses a single AI ecosystem, it could risk vendor lock-in within that provider's platform and set of services. Companies say the problem with vendor lock-in, especially among cloud providers, is that they have difficulty moving their data to other platforms, lose negotiation power with other vendors, and must rely on one provider to keep its services online and secure. Now, perhaps in response to that, you're seeing companies like Amazon and Google offer an approach where they create a sandbox or managed service environment where enterprises that trust either Amazon or Google can interact in a single place with all sorts of various AI models. Amazon's bedrock platform, in other words, isn't locking people into some Amazon LLM, but is instead creating a safe enterprise space for companies to interact with lots and lots of different models from OpenAI to Stable Diffusion and beyond. This may seem in some ways like deep insider baseball, but the way capital flows from investors to startups to enterprises to big tech companies is going to have, I believe, a dramatic impact on how the artificial intelligence space develops. And so understanding how those flows are evolving, I think, is a super valuable thing. Anyways, guys, let me know what you think in the comments or come join us on the AI Breakdown Discord. You can find a link to that on breakdown.network. And I can't wait to see you guys there to discuss this further. Thanks for listening or watching as always. And until next time, peace.